It is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. She is Sue Siegel. She's currently CEO of GE Ventures and has a long and varied background that we're going to get into in our conversation. Come on up, Sue. Uh, we're going to open by having Sue make a few remarks, and uh, then we'll just have a little conversation. Pull up a chair. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So good morning to all of you, and thank you very much to Arafi and to Alicia for having invited me to participate here. I have to say, I've always been quite impressed with DARPA and what DARPA has done. And I'm just going to open up a little bit in terms of some of the examples of how, in fact, we have participated with DARPA. Talk a little bit about where I think biology and the challenges we're going to have are going to be. And then actually ask DARPA some questions. Oh, yeah? <laughs> we're going to turn the tables here? Yeah, <laughs> and because you're in the valley and because uh, it sort of represents new possibilities with regards to how we partner. Um, with government agencies. So we'd love to have that type of conversation. So first of all, a couple of things I have to say is I'm so impressed that you've been able to package biology as technology even under a year of formation of the BTF. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Okay. And when, when I think about that, I mean, that's marketing. So like it or not, you guys, <laughs> you're also marketers at heart. And that is actually needed for people to get inspired, not only because of the cause, but frankly, because of some of the applications. So I commend you for that um, overall. I also want to say that um, one of the things that I think, as you were mentioning before, is this notion of everybody talks about we have the app. And having that app seems so trivial now to us in the sense that it's just something we use every single day. But the amount of progress that has happened in being able to get to that app, as you mentioned, the foundational aspects okay. of that were long and storied and lots of effort from multidisciplinary type of efforts had to come together. And that's what's happening in biology. And clearly, we all know that. And you guys, some of you are absolutely the forefront of this. In fact, some of the things that you're working on are hard to even comprehend. But yet, we know that if, in fact, we can bring them together, that foundational componentry of biology, when it's understood, when it's plagiarized through biomimicry, will be something that, in fact, can truly enable some of the solutions to the most intractable problems that we've had around. You know, I have to say, GE, we've worked with DARPA now for decades. And we've had very long um, successes associated to, um, am I not coming across? Is it because I didn't turn it on? I think you're on. Am I on? Yeah. We're going to amplify you a little bit. Can you hear me? Oh, well, now we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? All right. Um, so let, let me just say that in, at GE, we've worked with DARPA for quite some time. And, and for those of you who don't know GE, some of you might remember GE as we bring good things to life. I won't try to sing it for you. But we also are a very, very big company, about 300,000 plus employees. Um, soon to be a little bit over 400,000 plus because of um, the acquisition of Alstom in the energy space from the French government. Um, and in addition to that, we're in 170 countries. So the State Department's in 171. Gives you a little bit of a sense of, of, of how involved we are. And we run our innovation from a basic research standpoint from a central research organization. And that's run out of Niskanen Unit, New York. And there's all, actually six other centers across the globe in terms of innovation. And why I see DARPA as sort of being similar, or GE being similar to DARPA, is this cross-disciplinary notion that comes together to be able to attack problems. Now, why do I say that? When you look at um, what GE compose of, we make aviation, uh, we, we make airplanes, so jet engines. So to give you a sense, every 75 seconds, an airplane with a GE engine takes off. Um, we also make choo-choo trains, so locomotives, et cetera. Um, we make healthcare and imaging technologies and EEG technology and a number of measurement tools to allow for um, better health and the measurement of health, particularly in the diagnostic space. We do a tremendous amount in the world of um, real estate, which a lot of folks don't know. We, we own tons of real estate across the world and we're able to help and finance those. We have a big financial arm, and so you might say, well, what does that have to do with DARPA? But the computing power behind financial transactions and what has had to be understood in terms of analytics is huge. 
And then we've started something called the industrial internet that we, we, we term it, and you guys will have heard it as, uh, as the internet of things. We work on the internet of big things because we're really an industrial company. And this is all about the sensor technologies coming together with, of course, the aggregation power and the ability to be able to provide analytics associated to that to actually further what the applications can be. And that's where I think DARPA, with the BTO, with biology as a technology, when you start to think about these cross disciplines, this convergence coming together is so extraordinarily powerful and really starting to set the foundation of what we can apply to these biological problems over time. So a couple of things that I just want to make sure that I cover, and I know I'll forget them if I don't look at my notes. Um, one project that GE was actually involved in, which was with our Global Research Center, and just to give you a sense how, you know, a lot of folks will go, well, it's DARPA, it's defense. So why should I get involved with DARPA? Well, here's one for you, and I have many, but I'll just give you one. And that is, this is the world of digital mammography, okay? Way back when, DARPA and GE participated in looking at sort of the, the, the core technology which was around amorphous semiconductors. And it takes a long time, it took a long time in terms of that core technology to really further the advancement of that particular space. I'll tell you, so that you'll say, when the venture capital community, way too long for me to get involved. Companies, even as big as GE, will say, wow, that's a long horizon. So if not for government, if not for DARPA, and frankly, the ATP program, this technology would not have been able to be moved forward. Now, just imagine, this was also at a time when breast cancer was being really understood to be the earlier screening that you could do, the better off you might avoid the terminal implications to breast cancer. And we've seen that where now it's almost considered a chronic disease. Digital mammography was absolutely key to that. Amorphous semiconductor technology was absolutely key to that. DARPA was absolutely at the center of that. This was not just for defense. This was for social good. And frankly, that technology became one of the biggest sellers in GE Healthcare, and of course VCs like to hear that, be it a financial VC or a corporate VC, because you want to know there are market applications associated to some of this long-standing, high capital, intensive types of research. So if you can involve DARPA into this equation, I think some of these very fundamental questions in biology, which seem so intractable and yet work so well in the biological system, are things that we have a chance to actually, as entrepreneurs, as small companies, as big companies, and as government to actually partner around. Now, here's my question to DARPA. So it goes like this. So I didn't so know you got to go first on the question. <laughs> We're going to turn this around a little bit. Um, so it goes like this. So in, in, in Silicon Valley, the notion and culture of failure is actually one that's celebrated, that's right? right? So this notion of um, design, test, uh, uh, build and then replicate or, or learn is actually pretty embraced, and certainly one that DARPA embraces. In the Silicon Valley, you know it as lean, um, lean, um, lean startup, or you know it as lean launch pad or, uh, or startup launch pad. But the, the notion is get an MVP out, minimal viable product, go out and test it with your customers, and then come back and learn. And through that, you're going to have failure. Also through the building of companies, we have failure. But yet in the valley, we embrace that. Yeah. We figure out how to incorporate it into our systems. And one of the things I'm curious about, and I was thinking about it, is how would we start to incorporate that in the DARPA system? Because in fact, the review process, although inherent in the experimental process, is this test and design, test and, and, and learn, the system of the actual process of DARPA granting is one that I'd love to understand how that's adapting and how it's actually learning from failure. So <clears throat> that is something that I think Silicon Valley can bring to the equation. DARPA coming here, we have a real chance to actually advance this notion of coming together to apply some of the Silicon Valley techniques actually to the DARPA process and to the DARPA partnership to actually continue to advance, I think, 
the, the joint missing. Oh, great. Yeah, and we don't have to answer it right now, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. The other thing I would say in Silicon Valley that we have a tremendous opportunity to do is these early innovations in biology around consciousness, around replication, around some of the most provocative possibilities come with it, of course, ELSI implications, the ethical, the legal, the societal, and of course, the policy issues around it. And one of the things I think uh, the Silicon Valley, if you'd like, um, power has brought to this is a voice of innovation around these policies and being able to bring them to Washington, D.C. The good news with DARPA is our, since they're so cutting edge, since they're at the forefront of all of this, they've actually convened experts in this area to deal with these problems before they even arise. It's just part of the fabric. So if that's the case, how do we join in that pushing forward to get some of this actually articulated well and to actually advance the social good and for our troops to be able to get some of these technologies which frankly test all of the limits of all sorts of ethical issues be it regenerative medicine, the creation of synthetic biology tools and component parts when you're developing new organisms that we don't even know. You keep going, and it's just fantastic. Some of it sounds like science, fi uh, science fiction, and it's not. It's here. And some of you are doing it, so how do we make sure we can do it responsibly and jointly? The other thing I would say that jointly we can do together as a Silicon Valley crowd is really figuring out it's not just about technology development. And yes, biology is technology. And yes, we have to develop those component foundational biological tools, just like what happened for the digital mobile space and you know, Amazon Web Services and the ability to, to generate so many new business models. It's the business model that also has to come to this equation. And I think there's a tremendous amount that's happening in that particular space, particularly in early stage technologies like what DARPA essentially fosters, to really think about risk sharing models with the customers around our business models. How to think about, instead of having this just an asset sale, it's a sharing economy sale. When you think about some of the greatest value that's been created, and all the VCs know this, um, recently, it's been Uber, Airbnb, um, Snapchat. I mean, these are, these are new companies and value created, which many of you that are core in technology go, Tuh. but I have to tell you, Airbnb has a market cap bigger than Hyatt Hotels, okay? And Hyatt Hotels has been around for 57 years, and it's a great hotel. <clears throat> I won't say which, what Hilton's at, because we're here, but anyway, <laughs> when, when you start to think about that, Hold on a second, value creation can occur because of these new business models and our learning how to bring these together, early stage technologies, risk sharing together to create new business models is an imperative that I think we're gonna have to apply to this novel world of biology is technology. So with that, I'm gonna stop. That's a great start, thank <laughs> you. So, so I'm gonna try to quickly answer your question and then turn the tables back on you. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'll, I'll start by saying, having spent part of my time at DARPA and part in the Silicon Valley ecosystem, I think it's important to be very clear that our objectives are different. Our success at DARPA is we spark a new technology. Yep. When I was in venture capital, success was we, we built a great company. So you wanna be very clear. Even more crudely, it's about returns to your LPs. In order to <laughs> generate returns for your LP, absolutely. Yeah. But um, what we share is we're in different aspects of managing risk. And, and it, we reach for high impact. We're willing to take risk. I, I think those things are shared. And first, I think there, I'd love to import more lessons. Um, the things that we do at DARPA today is when we start a program, a program manager has a number of dollars and a period of time. They start off, they let these contracts. Those are very actively managed contracts. And the ones that are succeeding, we put more resources, we accelerate. If people are not finding their way, then you know, we, we'll give them as much time and rope as we possibly can and make sense. And, and those are the very hard judgments, as you know, in either yeah, environment, is when do you <clears throat> lean forward and keep trying a little more, and when do you just stop? But when w things aren't working, we do stop. Uh, it happens at the program level. If a program isn't happening, we'll stop and shift resources. So I think that, that that's, in my mind, that's core to managing risk, is you have to be willing to take risk, and you have to be willing to stop when it's just not working and then free people to go do the next thing. Uh, a very specific new example that 
that this office, the Biological Technologies Office, has championed is a new way of doing contracting. We knew that we wanted to be able to mm. reach small companies. Uh, we knew that many of them don't really enjoy reading the thousands <laughs> of pages of you know, the, the regulations and the formats. Um, and if you're not an organization structured to do that kind of business, we still wanted to be able to do business with you. We put out a new thing called an easy BAA, an easy version of the broad, broad area announcement that is for small contracts, 700,000 or less, but it, it allows us to engage in a very simple way, especially with companies that aren't designed to do business in the traditional way with DOD. BTO championed it, and actually Scott Ulrey is here from our contract shop. He was core to helping make that happen, sitting in the back over there. So we'd love to keep learning. Um, That's great. Let me ask you a question. I, I, I want to take your business model question and get more specific. I'd love to hear a specific example. Um, you've done so many interesting things. You've been in corporations. You've been in a, a, a classic, great Sandhill venture capital uh, firm and now corporate venture. What are the business models from those three different exposures you've had that were, pr what, what was a great match between a technology and a particular business model? Yeah, um, so let me give you an example. So one of the examples I'll give is at AFI Metrics, we developed a technology, and this was Steve Fodor and a number of scientists at AFI, along with the manufacturers, that was all around the first application being gene expression. So developing a photolithographic array with oligonucleotides essentially built in it to be able to understand the expression of genes as the human genome was being sequenced. Right. So it was an incredibly heady time, lots of fun, to say the least. But it was early technology. It wasn't perfect. We didn't have all the data. We didn't know if we had all the data. So one of the business models we had to put into place there was to figure out how would we could apply this risk sharing with our customers in, an, at the time, an asset-based kind of uh, world. And what do I mean by that? So the way typically it's been done is you sell the razor, and then you sell the razor blade. So asset-based se asset selling. One of the things we put into place, and this is crossing the chasm, George Moore, uh, uh, Jeff Moore kind of model, was figuring out how to do some risk-taking with our customers very early on through early access programs. We knew we did not have the solutions totally. In fact, we knew that these technologists were the ones that were going to develop the applications. We weren't. Yeah. And actually understood how it could be applied to biology or to the study of genetics or to the study of, um, of, of mathematics, if you'd like, um, in a way that we weren't going to be able to do it. So by being able to provide sort of an access type of approach into this, where we actually said, we'll get it to you early, but no, it's not perfect and know that in this, we will learn together and we will continue to iterate so it gets better and better. In the VC world, <clears throat> um, so what was the business model for Affymetrics? What, what was it was razor, razor blade, model? but it was also subscription, yeah, right? Okay. So there was a subscription model okay. associated to it. As they figured out what the market was Correct. and how to address it. And so that. it's right. subscription model, perfect technology, or make it better, because you never perfect it really. And then as you got it m much more improved, it was razor, razor blade model, got it. right? Okay. Uh, and you could repeat this, rinse and repeat in many different applications, et cetera. Right. The other thing I would say is there was sharing of new application areas and the other part of this is when you have a new technology, one of the things that Intel did very, very well, and then so we, we, we copied it at, at, at AFI, is this powered by sort of notion or Intel inside. And we did powered by AFI metrics. And you know, it took a long time to actually put these technologies into place where other businesses would then take them and develop out tests or other types of um, value creation around them. We now have about, well, Affymetrics now has about 32 of these different tests out there through a whole bunch of different companies to be able to actually do this. And one example of that, for example, is Verisite, which is all around thyroid cancer. So that gives you another model. In, in the VC world, and, and I'm going to go a little bit outside of health, um, uh, too, you can have all sorts of different business models associated to um, applying these technologies. And you know, the one that is known mostly around the software world, in the tech world, is really this SaaS model. So software as a service model, right? Where you are paying per click or per usage or per drink or per scan or per ever, what you want to say, to be able to, instead of buying the entire asset, the server, the whatever it might be. And 
you can take that model and start to say, all right, in the early access kind of approaches, if we can't, in, in order for some of the firms to get further ahead, there has to be a sharing amongst many because no one can quite afford to be able to take all the risk themselves. Then the company, so the VC company or the VC backed company, can actually then profit or benefit, I should say, because profitability takes a long time. I don't want to misword that. <laughs> um, but can actually benefit by having a consortium effect of being able to use early technologies through SaaS models across various companies that actually join the party. Or it could be across academics, or it could be across clinical um, groups, or it could be across enterprises. And so those kind of models were also ones that we explored within the VC world. You know, at GE, we're exploring all of it. Um, as a corporate VC, there's a, the difference I would um, couch as follows. So in the financial VC world, very, very important to understand building a company for value creation is very important. But ultimately, the only job and your responsibility is to return more than, and hopefully a certain a amount more, more, <laughs> more. Um, what you were given by your LPs, your limited partners. So make no mistake, that's what it's all about. In the corporate venture world, there's a little bit of a difference on that in the following way. Yes, we still have to return to our shareholders, and I am held accountable for returning. That said, we also have a strategic imperative as it relates to being able to further the research, the learning, the growth of the company and our various business right. units. So the partnerships that we might do with DARPA are really around figuring out these very, very, very early stage technologies that are completely and totally breakthrough that we fundamentally believe, as DARPA does, as BTO does, that are going to go and transcend industries. And therefore, it's very important us to participate. So as we explore as corporate VCs some of the companies that we're investing in, we will take early bets. We're careful in those early bets. But um, we do it thinking about various different business models. So hopefully that That's great. gives you some view. Let's get specific. Ta tell us about a, uh, maybe a company in your portfolio or a specific area that you think is in, in the very wide world of biological technologies. What do you think is interesting today? Well, um, so they tell you never to, to pick favorites, right? So um, I, I won't do that within our own portfolio, although we've got about 61 companies on our portfolio. That's exactly what I say when I get asked that question. <laughs> I know, you just I'm, can't. because I'm, I'm enjoying I, inflicting someone, it on someone. Believe me, I get these notes <laughs> afterwards, and it's like, you said that, and why didn't you, and can you think? And I'm like, ah. All right, so I'm just going to use general sort of spaces. Um, so where do I think it's really exciting? And, and, you know, the world of brain, I think we all know, it's been talked about, like, like the 90s was the, the decade of the brain. Well, now it's the century of the brain. Well, guess what? It's got to be around the brain, because it's one of the areas that we just don't have the biological tool sets to actually understand. So in the 60s, in cancer, when the national war on cancer was actually declared, when you think about cancer, it was that coming together and that force to really be able to help us start to solve the issues around cancer. Big difference in cancer. You got a tumor, you cut it out, you biopsy it, you understand it better. Can't quite do that with the brain. Not very many people sign up to get brain biopsies when you're alive. So we have to figure out non-invasive technologies to actually understand much more around the brain, to understand brain sickness and brain health, to understand the notion around what is consciousness, what is memory, what is behavior, how do we change behavior, how does pain get modulated? So we're doing a lot of investing in that space of understanding basic technology tools that can actually help us be non-invasive around either understanding the brain better or, in fact, if you'd like, providing tool sets that would allow the understanding of, for example, pain modulation, just to give you a sense. Um, another space that we... That, that's great, and I think we're going to be talking a lot more about See about with Carl that. and, and, and a number of other folks that are actually going to talk about that. Um, another area that we find just, you know, very, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit beyond um, uh, the world of health, but it has applicability is in, in the energy world, 
um, where we invest. And, and, and just to give you a sense, GE produces about 30% of the energy that comes off, 30% of the world's energy comes off of some GE system. So it gives you a sense of scale. And so we're looking at all sorts of different alternatives. One of the alternatives we're looking at is how might we consider synthetic biology? How might we consider um, the application of that to actually much more efficient technology uses? We also fundamentally believe that the next horizon around energy management is going to be around energy efficiency and thinking about what are the computational um, advances that can be done for predictive power right. um, associated to that. And those have all sorts of different business models on it. Um, we're in advanced manufacturing. And where do biological tools come into place here? So this one surprised me a bit. I don't understand it fully. Um, you guys know it much better than I do, so I'm not going to pretend. Um, but what I, what I hear is we're looking at how to um, make manufacturing processes even more efficient by disrupting supply chains. Part of that disrupting supply chains is managing the hordes of data, just like you've heard from Walmart and P&G and a whole bunch of different yeah. places. But the storage issues are, in fact, an issue. So storage is something that a lot of companies are trying to grapple with, despite AWS and whatnot. When you think about how do you start storing computing power, da -da -da -da, biology comes back into place. And how, and I think George Church is going to talk about this, right? How we'll are find we, out what George is going to talk about. <laughs> um, how are we going to harness that? In what time frames can we harness that? What sort of investments are really going to be required? Uh, not just for you know, company efficiencies and usage, because there's so much data to be mined, to be learned in terms of predictive behaviors of either enterprises, people, communities, et cetera. How, 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 do, we get, it's, how do we get our arms around that? Yeah. So I could go on, but it no, gives you a little a bit of a example. sense of some of the things we're working you, on. You know, you touched on something that personally fascinates me about biology, which is we study the smallest organisms all the way up to, you know, my favorite species is ours. And, and uh, I, I think there, we're going to be, maybe it will take even more than a century to fully understand our species and how we behave. Let me shift the conversation a little bit to talk about people. Uh, I'm guessing we have people in the room who live in the research world who might be future entrepreneurs, or maybe their students are going to be future entrepreneurs. When you meet with a company, when you talk to uh, people starting companies, what are the characteristics you look for to see if, in fact, w the person you're talking to is a future successful entrepreneur rather than a researcher? Because I think they're, they're two noble causes, but different. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I mean. Th uh, and many VCs will say similarly some of these sort of basic principles, which is we always look at first and foremost, well, I shouldn't say first and foremost, we always look at market, team, and technology, all right? And technology substitute with business models these days, particularly in the IT space. So let's go to team, which is at the heart of your question. And, um, and this is particularly important in the world of biology where there is much more inherent risk in early technologies, and therefore much more capital deployment, and therefore a longer time horizon, and therefore not as many VCs participating in this space yeah. as there used to be. Um, and I won't even mention regulatory and reimbursement. <coughs> Ooh, did I mention that? Oh, gosh. Um, so <laughs> That's a whole other topic. It is a whole other topic. So when, when, when they come to us, and they ask us, can I build a company around this? And we get asked that a lot. And at More David Al Ventures, we were very, very early stage technologists. And so we helped build companies from scratch. One of the things we wanted to see is entrepreneurs so believe, they so believe, that they'll argue you to the ground. And we also want to know they're pragmatic, meaning it's not just about the technology. It's really about, let's talk about the various elements of the business model. Can you relate with us that, in fact, there is a reimbursement hurdle, that there is a regulatory hurdle, that, in fact, the capital required to actually build your particular company is going to take a lot? And therefore, what does that mean in terms of returns to the VCs? And again, it's a little different in the corporate VC world. You know, we, we, we look at it a bit differently. But for the financial VC, we really do think about the, the balance of capital versus time horizon, versus the potential to be actually liquid or exit in the, in, in the world that you've got. One thing I will say about this, and, and, and that is the following. It, 
the, the life science biology space, there has been a flight of VCs from that space because of the hurdles I mentioned on both regulatory and reimbursement. The amount of capital it now takes to pass those hurdles, it used to be you could launch a device company. So for those of you who are thinking about new devices in this world, it used to be you could launch it for about $60 million total, and the typical kind of exit value was somewhere between 300 to $500 million, and sometimes even higher. Now it's about $120 million is what is being looked at as sort of average in terms of devices and investment, and the kind of exits you're getting are somewhere between 150 to 300. So right there, the compression of multiples, the financial right. returns are very, very tough. It's partially the reason why this public-private partnership with the likes of DARPA, with the likes of government, is so important because they're non-dilutive dollars. DARPA's not asking for a piece of equity in the company. Not yet, right? No. Well, we don't plan to. <laughs> Just checking. We're you not, guys we're are not so the innovative. We're building business. We want to get the technology <laughs> bubble. We, we actually value getting it to the point where a financial investor can come in and drive it forward. So we're happy to be before so that. So this part is really important to us. And this is why this cultivation of the ecosystem to understand here in Silicon Valley that early risk removal. Yeah. So that entrepreneur who understands how to actually engage with DARPA with this new type of application and actually knows how to remove some of the technology risks that we're going to talk about. That's the first thing we're going to talk to you about. So tell me what your milestones are along the way that you've actually hit on those technology milestones. This is where DARPA can help you with regards to TRLs and really re removing some of that technology risk. Um, I, just to tag on to your comment, I, I, I absolutely, I think we've seen the, the increase in capital cost, the modest returns, and the equation doesn't solve. But of course, at the same time, the opportunities for the financial investor um, it, to do social media and a lot of other new areas that have the opposite characteristic, right? That it's costing less and less uh, because of the ability to leverage the, this vast IT ecosystem and get these enormous multiples. So that's the flavor du jour. Um, wh when you look in your crystal ball, wh one thing that's always dangerous in Silicon Valley is saying, well, what we're doing today is what's going to happen forever. I'm curious to see what, what's in your crystal ball about what will be the kinds of opportunities that maybe create a, a, ne a next wave that, that might be perhaps more pertinent to the ambitions in this room. Um, gosh, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and so please, uh, uh, with you, we create crystal balls, right? So I just want to be really frank about that. But I think when we sit around and talk about what is possible in this world of biology and where we might be able to invest, I'm going to take a little bit of your notion of this flight towards the digital, OK? So this is not a 10-year horizon. This is the immediate, and then I'll talk a little bit about the horizon. The, the, the immediate and where um, VCs and even corporations are going is that convergence and marriage between whatever the asset is, whatever the physical technology is, and the ability to actually have data exhaust associated to it. So the digitization of data, the monetization of data, the way you utilize data to actually create value, how you actually think about that value creation, how you price it, that is a model which I think is going to be around for a very long time. And it's more of the model of where the Silicon Valley and the corporate venture capitalist are looking to be. You no longer see a biological tool just being invented for the sake of the tool in terms of VC-backed companies. What you're seeing is that tool will have some type of connectivity, so some type of sensor that will allow you to be connected to the world in whatever shape and form, will allow you to aggregate data, and will allow you to do something with that data that, in fact, will add to the value of the creation that you're doing. So I think that's going to be around for a very, very long that's time. That's a great point. <clears throat> um, I, I, but I think it's here today. And I think those that can come up with those kind of monetization, value creation um, around these you know, breakthrough tools are remarkable. I mean, that, that, that would be remarkable. And people will say, OK, DARPA takes some of the risk out of technology. We'll come in as you guys remove most of those risks. But let's talk about the business model. Let's talk about the data exhaust. 
and then we work together to figure out how you, you actually get value around it. So that's one of the ways I think about it. That's great. I think, I think that's it. actually a terrific thought. Thank you very much, Sue. We appreciate your comments.